All right, let's go. Let's let's turn let's turn off the music. Oh, we got it. Hey, um, hi, welcome to the DevSecCon Australia chapter. Uh, we are one of the chapters within the global DevSecCon community, and obviously, this is an um, inclusive community that educates and enables developers in application security. Well, that is the line that I had to practice, and I'm trying to put that out nicely. But today we have somebody uh, who will come um, come on uh, this uh, this stream, who will talk actually actual sense. Uh, I've got Laura backstage, and she will talk about um, secure software that will change the world. Well, but before that, let me introduce myself. My name is Brian Vermeer. I am actually based in Amsterdam, so I am not your normal host. I know it's 4 p.m. in Sydney and it's 6 p.m. in New Zealand, but it's my 8 a.m. Um, so this is not really convenient, but it's fun. So that's why I'm here. I am a staff developer advocate for Sneak and I am a long-term Java backend developer. Don't hold that against me. Uh, I just had a talk with Laura uh, backstage and she accused me that backend developers like me are responsible for YAML, which we are not. But hey, um, we're getting back to that anyway later. Um, again, I am not your usual host, but unfortunately, um, some of our chapters uh, don't have hosts yet. Well, Australia had a host, but uh, the host had to step down um, for personal reasons. And uh, we are looking for a fresh face. So if you feel like, hey, this hosting and, and running a community that is focusing on secure development and DevSecOps uh, is something for me, please chime in and we will be happy to to help you out. You don't have to do it on your own. Um, obviously, I will help you, but we've got our amazing humans like Sam Hepburn, who is running all of this behind the screens, uh, and she will set you up with everything you need. So if you feel like, hey, this is nice, uh, chime in and um, um, we will help you out. And we will, we, are, we, we will be very grateful if you want that. Anyway, during the session, you can uh, ask questions. You can ask questions using the YouTube or Twitch chat, and I can see that here in my screen. I can put it in and we can answer the questions if they are, uh, if we have time for that, obviously. But if that's not the case, go and jump on our Discord channel. Um, let me put up the banner. Like over here, you will see that we have a Discord community, and that is the best way to connect with our speakers and to connect with other DevSecOps and DevSecCon followers to see it from the other chapters worldwide or just your local uh, Australia chapter in this case. But it's a great community uh, if you have questions whatsoever that are related to any of the topics. Uh, people are, are very happy to chime in um, and you can discuss things either DevSecOps related or anything else, but it's it's great to uh, to interact. Anyway, all the sessions, including this one, will be, well, taped, basically, because we're streaming it, and we can rewatch it afterwards on our website, either on YouTube, or we put these things on our website right, right away. Uh, DevSecCon, the whole community, is brought to you by Sneak as the main sponsor, and our aim is to create a vendor-neutral space to share knowledge. So even if you are a competitor of Sneak, and you think, like, I have something great to talk about, as long as it's not a vendor pitch, I'm in. Okay, right now, that's enough for me. Let's bring up Laura and let's see if I am capable enough in the morning to put her on screen. And yes, I am. Hey, Laura, Hello. how are you? Hello, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I have my first cup of coffee almost finished, so I am good to go. But how are you? Uh, I am great. And if you finish your coffee, you're overachieving. So um, slow oh, okay. down. Okay, I will, I will, I will slow you. down. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely, cool. <laughs> so you're going to talk uh, about... Um, um, securing software that will change the world. Like that's that's a bold statement. Changing the world with software. Absolutely. Um, that that's what we're here for, right? We don't get up in the morning and go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to secure software. We we get up in the morning. We want to build software that's going to do something, change our world, change our lives. Um, and that's you know one of the ways we're going to need to frame security going forward as the how we can best be part of that and enabling us to change the world uh, and that's going to be scary and the unknown territory for us so yeah um exciting I, times I, ahead i agree i was one of those engineers back in the days that hey we have some security checks somewhere in a ci pipeline how can i loop around them to still make everything go to production because that was my kpi <laughs> Absolutely. Engineers going to engineer. If you put a, a block in front of them, they're going to go around it or through it or under it or build a bridge. Um, so we can't change that. So we may as well do something a bit different. I, I'm, I'm with you. Let me put up your slide deck and I would say the floor is yours. Tell me about Fabulous. it. Fabulous. 
Well, this is always strange when you do a remote talk and you're on the internet. So if you are watching live, welcome. Hello. It's lovely to see you. You look great. I love what you've done there. If you're watching later, you're still looking great too, but you've had more time to prepare. So I had a higher expectation of you. Now, let's get into it. My name is Laura Bell Main. Now, um, as uh, Brian mentioned, this is all a vendor neutral space, but I happen to work for a company called SafeStack. This isn't about us. Um, and I say work for, I was silly enough to start it. Now, um, this is me. I'm not an artist. Um, this talk, though, there's a lot of me in it. There's a lot of my worldview, a lot of my feelings and opinions, and that's okay. In fact, you know, you're going to have feelings and opinions too. You can have questions and comments. So feel free to stick those in that Discord channel that we mentioned or whichever medium that you're in, because I'd love to get into a debate with you. I'd love to have a bit of a chat because that's how we get better at this, right? Now, other than being a dot on a screen, I am a massive nerd. Now, particularly sci-fi nerd. I've been reading and watching sci-fi things since I have been, you know, teensy tiny little version of me. Now, while I don't think the world is going to look like the fifth element in this picture, I do think the world is changing very, very rapidly. And the technologies we're building to enable that in all sorts of fields are incredible. Now, if you're not excited about the future of technology and you're in security, this is not a good time for you to be in security. Uh, in all honesty, to be very crude, you would be better retraining and becoming a plumber because you're going to earn a little bit more and you're still shoveling other people's waste. So it's the same sort of deal. But if you, like me, are excited, at least about one technology, just pick one, then this is the talk for you. Because what I want to do is share why technology is so important to the changing world, where security fits into it, and then some of the really interesting challenges that are coming up in security that we're all going to have to solve together. And we do not have the answers at this point. In fact, I don't think we're even close. So let's get on. Now, a bit of background about me. Um, I'm a bit of a weird hybrid. I've been a bit of everything. I started age 16 as a COBOL developer. I don't recommend that as a career path, um, but it does pay well now. Um, I've done time in AI and robotics before that was a real job. Again, bad at career planning. Done real-time radiation monitoring software in C++ for CERN, counterterrorism and online harm. Been penetration tester. And then about 15 years ago, I started to try and find a way that you could go fast and build amazing systems, but do security through it. Now, this is a field that has grown a lot since those early days. Um, but it means that I've lived and do live on both sides of the coin. I am a developer. I still write and cut code, uh, mostly in Python these days. But also, I've been a penetration tester. I've been a red teamer. I've been on the offensive side. And so I sit in this weird space and I try and live and breathe both. It's kind of a bit distracting at times, but either way. So let's talk about the amazing technology that's coming and the why, because I think that's really, really important. And we're going to start off with three stories. I'm going to tell you about technologies that I think are interesting or exciting and where security fits into them. Now, Depending on your background and where you physically live in the world right now, some of these things might be quite foreign to you. And that's okay. That's cool. Just come along for the ride. So let's talk first about a vineyard. Now, a vineyard is where you grow grapes. Now, um, in New Zealand, we're really lazy. We also call them wineries, which is not entirely true. Uh, but they are massive, massive spaces where you have row after row after row of grapevines. Now, in New Zealand, where I live, Wine and the production of grapes and wine is a massive part of our economy. Australia, no different. Um, and there's other parts of the world that we know are famous for wines and have this kind of challenge. Now, those of you at home who are, you know, developers, back end, front end, I don't care. You're probably looking at this and going, what on earth does this have to do with security, right? It has nothing to do with security. It has nothing to do with software. And this is where you're wrong. You see, there's some really interesting technical challenges in a vineyard environment. The first question is, how healthy are my grapes and when are they ready to harvest? Now, that's really easy if you're like me and you've got one grapevine in the garden and you can kind of see it from your window. You just kind of go and have a look and poke it and see if it's OK. And if the birds have started eating it, you're probably too late. But when you've got literally acres of uh, vineyards, then it's not the case that you can just go and touch each one and go and have a look. Even doing a sample isn't going to help. 
Now, this number, though, is really important. Knowing when they are ready, knowing that they are healthy is key to your entire business model. So there is a technical solution. Um, uh, a company called Cropsy in New Zealand does it. I'm sure there are others around the world um, that mount sensors onto existing farm vehicles that use AI to detect the health and readiness of grapes on the vine. So it's essentially like strapping a mega super powered AI GoPro to an existing John Deere tractor. And that's going to do your job for you because as you're driving around the vineyard, you can automatically detect the health and number and and readiness of your grapes. This is fantastic because you're already driving around your vineyard anyway. Now, again, how did we get from this to security? Well, this is software. This is software and custom hardware, if I'm honest. And there's something in this that we don't think about. When we think about security, we tend to think about contexts like health or finance, where we're like protecting dollars or protecting people from harm. They're great. They're really important. But the count of healthy grapes is also incredibly important and has to be protected. Because you see, a vineyard is a just-in-time business. That means they don't know how many people they're going to employ each season, how many boxes they need to buy. They don't know what price they're going to be able to sell their grapes for or their wine once it's made. The readiness and health of the crop impacts all of that. Now, if you take this back to a data security problem and not about actual squishy, ripe grapes, we have a piece of critical data, our count of healthy grapes, where they are in the vineyard, when they're ready to go. And if we're not able to trust that, if the integrity of that data is compromised, then we may hire too few workers or too many and end up with either grapes rotting on the vine or people standing around, either are bad for business. We may not have enough packaging. We may negotiate the wrong prices on our things. Now, in a country like New Zealand, where wine is such a huge part of our economy, that's not just disrupting one business. That disrupts an entire supply chain and part of a GDP. So like fun story, what I'm saying is if you hack the software that controls a winery, you can disrupt a country, which is really weird when you start thinking about it. So that's a, vi a vineyard. What about athletes? Um, I am not a professional athlete. I, I don't know what gives it away really. Um, but I spend quite a lot of time watching them on the TV and going to games and things. Now, these on the screen right now are the Black Ferns. They're one of my favorite teams in the whole world. And then the New Zealand women's rugby team. And they're really amazing. If you want to go and watch a new sport, go watch them. What you can't see in this picture, however, is the technology. And there is a massive amount of technology in this picture. Because you see a, an athlete, such as a professional rugby player or a tennis player or a soccer player, whichever your sport of choice is, these are incredibly well-managed and well-monitored people. To get the most out of an athlete and to keep them safe, we have to keep track of a lot of data. So the challenge here from a technical perspective is to monitor how are my athletes performing? Are they safe? Do they need any interventions? Um, but how do we do this? Well, we do it with technology. We do it with wearable sensors, with fabrics, with things we embed in helmets, in headbands, in watches. For those of you who are wearing a smartwatch today, you're already wearing part of these technologies. Now, in that rugby team picture, it was a tiny little sensor that lives at the back of the neck, just underneath the collar. And that measures everything from the speed of travel to impacts, to heart rate, to the temperature of the skin. You name it, it's being measured. Now, let's have a look a little bit more in detail. See, there's a whole bunch of these, no matter what sport or what field you're in. And they're really key to us understanding performance. Now, I knew I was middle-aged when I started digging into this and discovered that one of the items that is available is a pair of Bluetooth-enabled sensor socks, which can tell you how wide your stride is and how many steps you take. And I knew I was middle-aged because my first question was, well, how do you wash them? And the second you're asking about laundry, you know that that's it, you're, you're, you're old. Uh, but the rest of the technologies, there's an incredible range of them. You name the sport, there's somebody developing a technology for it, whether it's built into the fabric itself or it's a wearable device like a watch or a bracelet uh, or something that's mounted inside something like a helmet or a heads up display. 
So why do we do this? Why is the technology, technology involved? Well, athletes work in a really high risk environment. Let's have a look at rugby players as a specific example. In rugby, you are literally intentionally having high impact collisions with other people. Same as American football, if there's any Americans watching. And at the point there is an impact, we have an obligation as managers, as coaches, as teams to monitor those individuals and check for signs of concussion because concussion is career ending. It's also life ending in some cases. So these sensors aren't just about, am I going as fast as possible or am I going to score enough goals or get enough tries or whatever it is in the sport that you're looking at? It also reduces injury. It also helps us plan for better future performance. Now, um, if you are a professional athlete, a lot of your career is based on your previous performance turned into a monetary value, and then you're signed for a team, you go and have a lovely career somewhere else. Now, if you don't have good data, or the data is not trustworthy, those values are compromised. So what could go wrong with this? Why do we need to care about security in wearable technologies in sports? Well, it reduces injury or spots it quicker so that we can keep people physically safe. And it helps individual athletes and teams perform better over time and retain their value. Cool. Awesome. Now, if you were wondering about that concussion thing, this is a literal sensor from American football. So uh, you can go dig into whatever sport you like and go and find these. Now, I'm sure if you were an American football player or a rugby player and you've got a piece of technology on you that's going to save your life and spot a concussion, you'd want to make sure that the data on it was really safe and you could really trust it. So not just the confidentiality, because nobody wants to have their number of concussions spread to the world, but the integrity of it and the availability of it are really, really key. OK, our third story, I promised three and here's our third. So we're going to talk about packages. Now, who amongst you has, you know, perhaps had a bit of a boring night, found yourself on Amazon or Ali or some other site and ended up impulse buying, you know, a few pairs of shoes or a rubber duck or whatever it is that you do. Now, we've all done it. In fact, packages are one of the growest, uh, biggest growing industries at the moment, sending things around the world, not letters anymore. We're no longer writing each other cards, but we are sending things to ourselves primarily from online stores. Now, when a package hits the, the delivery system, the ecosystem is actually a really technical space to come into. If you've not been in a shipping or logistics space, I encourage you to find a way to go and dig into it because it's fascinating. This is a picture of a warehouse and it's not even a particularly big one. Warehouses and logistics pipelines are technology playgrounds from the decisions about where you place items in the uh, environment to which order you should pack and pick them to what needs to be kept at what temperature and in what um, style of air conditioning <clears throat> and to what um, tax needs to be paid at what point in the, the process. There is technology for everything. And that means there's a lot of challenges. So let's start with just one of them. How can I manage my logistics warehouse? Or very specifically, where should I put this box? So if you imagine that this pot here was a package, um, it's not, it's, it's clips for putting pictures on the walls. But imagine it was, and you have just walked up to a giant Amazon warehouse that's as big as three football fields, then it's not the case if you just put it in the corner and, you know, you know, stack them up and eventually you'll just move across the warehouse. You have to be very intentional about where you place every single item in that space because that helps us understand how to process it next, how to find it later, and how to store it securely and appropriately. Now, if any of you like me attended university, you may well have seen this before. This is known as Dijkstra's algorithm. It is a graph tra traversal algorithm, or it's a, a way of us planning the best route through a nodes and edges network. Now, Dijkstra's has been around a very, very long time, but nowhere is it more pertinent than a logistics system where, you know, say st spot A is me in New Zealand here and spot F is Brian over in Amsterdam, then we've got to get through an entire logistics network through multiple countries, borders, logistics providers to get the package from A to F. And there's a lot of technology used to make sure that we're choosing the right pathways and that we're doing this as safely and as predictably as possible. Now, to do this, this isn't about going, well, 
oh, I always send it this way, this way, this way. This was actually one of the biggest early adopters of machine learning has been in logistics and shipping. So arranging, stacking, and processing orders, having picking orders for delivery. The other side of it is using things like picking robots to ensure that the machine learning is being used efficiently by a, uh, an entity in the environment that can move freely uh, and follow those instructions. The whole idea being that we can get packages from A to F as quickly and as consistently as possible. So this is one of those robots. It's not very much to look at because I, I, yeah, I really love robots. Um, and this one's, you know, it, it, it's cute, but it's not, you know, a Boston Dynamics kind of legged robot type thing. But these also help the safety in our warehouses because, you know, warehouses aren't, you know, two shelves tall. It's not like you just go on your tiptoes to get those packages. They are tall. And we're not talking about small packages. We're talking about big packages that are very, very heavy. And so by using robots with machine learning involved, we are able to reduce the accidents um, and make sure there are less people wandering around this space where they could get hurt. So lots of technology, loads of cool technology. And if you wanted to look at some cool technical challenges, I really do um, recommend go and look at logistics and shipping. There's some really crazy cutting edge tech going on in there. So why for security? Let's bring it back to that security piece. Well, shipping and haulage and logistics are a massive complex puzzle. If you like complex puzzles, this is your jam. Optimal, optimal route planning and physical placement is key, and it reduces handling time, spoilage, theft. But if we interfere with these algorithms, if I'm able to change where a system says I should place my thing, we can disrupt that. So when we come back to security, we talk about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Well, confidentiality, we don't want people to know where all of the packages are at any one point, because if I was particularly super inter interested in picture clips, for whatever reason, let's pretend that they're really valuable now, and I could find out where all of the, bo the boxes of clips were in the, the warehouse, great, because if I'm going to be a thief, that's where I'm going to go. Fantastic. It makes my job a lot easier. So confidentiality is super important. Integrity is important because if we can't trust the data, we're going to go look on a shelf, not find the item. Or we're going to put our item into the system and it's not going to come out where we expect it to be. So integrity is cool. Availability, equally so. Nobody wants delays in their shipping system. Now, during COVID, when we were all staying at home and the package volumes increased, but the complexity of running business also increased, we saw that supply chains were massively impacted by slowdown in parcel delivery. Now, parcels could just be you buying a rubber duck off Amazon, but it could be medicines. It could be hospital equipment. It could be key building materials to rebuild after a physical event, such as a flood or an earthquake. So making sure that our systems are available and that data is available to use is really key to keeping that flow of packages going. And that keeps us healthier and safer and allows us to buy rubber ducks at 2 a.m. So let's talk about the hack. So we've got this amazing world of technology that's going to change the world. Now, these aren't even my favorites. My favorites are things like AI doctors and all sorts. You could go for literally I could do several of these talks with cool technologies. But let's talk a bit about the how. How do we protect all of these amazing technologies that are going to save the world? Well, the first thing we do need to do is we need to accept that in every industry, there is a technology that is making fundamental change right now. I have a podcast, it's called Build Amazing Things Securely, and I interview people from all sorts of industries, and from esports and gaming, to fashion, to fintech, to uh, reporting, you name it, there is a cool technology being built, and I'm having a wonderful time interviewing and meeting the people who are designing and building them. So go and find them. Go and have a look for these stories, because you're never going to be inspired if you're just looking at banking systems. It's not that exciting. Sorry, banking folks. So go find the other exciting technologies out there, because you might find them quite inspiring for other things. But the thing we have a problem with is all the security guidelines that we've been given were not built with the future in mind. They're retroactive, they're retrospective. Now have a look at this. Now I love OWASP and the OWASP top 10, so please don't take this as an attack on them. OWASP, the web app, open web application security project, um, has been producing this top 10, so the top 10 vulnerabilities in web applications now since 2003, so 20 years. 
But if you look at the list in 2003 versus the list in 2021, and it's released every two years, give or take, you'll notice something. You notice that we may have changed the words a little bit, but the vulnerabilities remain the same. And that's because they're looking at the same styles of systems. We're looking for the same things we've seen before. We're not looking for new things. Now, what does this mean for us? It means that if we're going to protect these future looking systems, we need to be able to protect us from what is coming in the future, not just what has come before us. And that's hard. It's much easier for me as a security person to say, hey, I've seen this before. Here, we know this works. Go do it. But we're not in that space anymore. Now we're in a space where we're talking about flying cars and legged robots and drone delivery services and AI doctors. None of these were reviewed for the OWASP top 10. And so we have a gap in our knowledge. Now, you can see that as really terrifying or as a really exciting opportunity. I choose to be excited by it because that means we've got work to do. And the best people to do that work are not security specialists like me. They are engineers. Um, and so that's cool. Let's talk about that some more. You see, there's a whole bunch of challenges coming through that are bigger and more complex than they've ever been before. So let's talk about architectural complexity. When I started out in my career as an engineer, I worked for a tax system for a while. It's very boring. I don't recommend it. But it meant I could go home at five o'clock and nobody cared if the system went out at 6 p.m. because nobody was back till 9 a.m. the next day. And architecturally, this was the time of monolithic applications. Things were pretty well contained, and they were pretty much well defended on the border by network security. That's not the way anymore. We now distribute our systems. We're looking at more microservice architectures or variations of. And we're using a lot more third-party integrations than we ever have before. Um, and that's cool. It allows us to do new things. But it means we don't control the risk. And when we're building systems where we don't control all the risk anymore, that's a new set of challenges. We have non-linear code pathways. Now, if you've been playing around with AI, and I genuinely hope you have, there's so many exciting things to be done with it. This is an interesting space as a security person because in threat assessments, so the way that we plan attacks and we think, how could this go wrong? We're used to the idea of a system being linear. So if I start at step one and do all of my steps in order, I will get the same result. Now, in AI-based systems or systems based on evolving models like LLMs, then we've got a different thing happening. You can put your input in, but because the model is changing with time, the output or the steps it takes may change with it. And that means we can't do these linear kind of code reviews and system walkthroughs because there's an evolution happening, there's change happening. And so it's very hard to predict what can go wrong when you can't predict all of the potential pathways through a system. That's cool. It's really hard and it introduces risk, but it's cool. Now, if you want to read more about that, the OWASP project actually released uh, in the OWASP top 10 for LLMs this week. So that's out in version one. So you can go and get that now and have a look. We're looking at continuous availability a larger community, a larger number of applications. It's an exciting time, but this is not a set of challenges we have predefined answers for. So let's look at some of the challenges that we're gonna need to fix together if we're going to secure the software that's gonna change the world in the way that we need it to. So in natural language, we've got the risks of using a predefined corpus. So a predefined corpus is a pre-made training set that you can use to train your own model. But that brings us into the risk of data poisoning. Um, can we poison our corpus? Can you get bad things into a training set and affect the outcomes? Now, we know we've seen this before. If any of you remember when Microsoft released its first AI chatbot a few years ago, and we went from essentially Taylor Swift to um, uh, Donald Trump within about 10 hours on the internet, it wasn't a great look. Um, that was a poisoning. That was poisoning a, a training model with bad data. We're using pre-trained models. If you've started integrating with a pre-trained LLM of any description, you don't control what that model is doing. And therefore, there's a black box element, an element where you cannot see inside the walls of it. No code and low code are more prominent. That's not a problem. It's kind of like Lego. I love it. We can build more things easily in more consistent ways. But again, we lack the transparency there. If there is a problem with a shared no code or low code solution, that problem is inherited by any people who are using it. 
which means as an attacker, if I'm able to compromise a centralized system like a no-code platform, I can compromise all of the things that hang off it. And that's very efficient. As an attacker, I like this. IP theft, data sovereignty, you know these, we've been looking at them, deep fakes. Um, if you haven't created your own deep fake of yourself, go for it. It's actually quite a lot of fun and you can learn a lot. Um, do it with a voice one to start with and you'll find it's actually eerily simple to clone a voice. Now, data science, large and complex data sets, increased regulation. These are going to make things really, really hard for us. We want to experiment with our data. It's really, really important that we do. But how do we keep it safe while we do? How do we decide what we can store and what we can't and where we can store it? How do we decide the owner of data and what our life cycle and regulations are? Not everywhere in the world has privacy law that is mature enough to cope with this yet. And there's a lot of issues such as um, the data sovereignty of indigenous data that are still undefined. So we really need to tread carefully and make sure we're thinking about this. Now, my favorite area of chaos um, and therefore wonder, wonderful opportunity and security is IoT. Now, IoT is exploding everywhere, whether it's your toaster or your fridge or the watch you're wearing or apparently socks. Um, Mass-produced commodity devices with internet connectivity in them are now commonplace. There's no fighting that. If you want to do a bit of science after this, uh, a friend of mine, Simon Howard, who runs ZX Security, he once suggested uh, setting yourself a $10 limit and going on to AliExpress and seeing if you could just buy yourself a whole range of cheap IoT devices. It's a really great way to give yourself a playground to play with IoT security. Now, IoT is going to be fundamental in this future technology. You know, it's built into cars. Cars now are often having at least nine IoT systems in them before they've even begun. So IoT is going to be not just for, you know, giz gizmos and gadgets you buy at a commercial level, uh, but also embedded into the technology that you're using every day. We need to talk as a community about what this means, because IoT devices are quite throwaway. They're often, a lot of them are you know, commercially just left behind or never updated. If you think about your TV, that's a great example of that, where you might own your TV for, say, eight years, but actually your manufacturer is only providing security updates for a year and a half. Now, we've got a gap in IoT, and it's really, really important that we, uh, we figure out how we do that and how long are we as engineers responsible for the security of that code. Now, none of these have easy answers. None of them are specific to one territory or geography or country or industry, but they all need solving. This is far more than just SQL injection. Securing the future means new novel challenges we haven't seen before. Now, there are 13 million software developers in the world right now, and so I think we can do it. We grow at a rate of 1.2 million per year. Now, this isn't the case of us needing lots of security specialists. What we need is to make security part of code quality, because that's what it is. It's not about where you stick your DevSecOps, and it's not about being agile or whatever. It's about all of us putting it alongside performance and scaling and usability and just making security part of what we do. Now, many of us are nowhere near the cutting edge of security. Now, if you're watching this and going, yeah, well, all those other organizations have got this covered, they really don't. Um, our data so far shows that less than 2% of organizations really have it together when it comes to DevSecOps and security. We work with 1,800 organizations in 78 countries now, and these data sets hold true for that. The rest of us who aren't at the cutting edge, who aren't Netflix, are emerging. We're just getting started. And so there's a lot for us to do, but a lot of potential for us to improve. Because we're not all independent to each other. Our systems are connected in ways we can't even imagine. Whether it's because we buy and sell from each other, because we integrate into each other, our architectures, our applications, our libraries and components are all linked. Now, that has a really serious impact on why this matters. So whether you're a vineyard or a professional athlete and wearing sensor technology or you're running a warehouse, you're probably connected to hundreds of other organizations around the world by the technologies you use by the relationships you hold, by the commercial arrangements you make. And that means that to protect one of us, we have to protect all of us. Because if one of us is harmed, then all of us are, risk, are at risk. Now, an example of this, and I'm certainly not attacking Heroku uh, or Salesforce who own them, um, because, you know, hug ups to anyone who has a breach. 
But Heroku had a breach uh, last year where private keys were exposed to environments. Now, Heroku as a cloud hosting platform hosts 9,000 plus organizations, about 13 million applications in total. Now, if you're able to compromise the shared component that's shared between 13 million applications, that's a big problem. Now, I want you to think about your dependencies, all the third party things you integrate with or you have in your stack. Is there anything in there that you think is used by a lot of people? Because that could be where your first risk lies. We call this supply chain attacks, but it's the same thing, whether you call it fancy terms or not. Now, I want you to go away from this talk, not feeling overwhelmed by security, but inspired that if we're going to do our little bit to change the world, to save the world, then we can help solve some of these security things. And we can do it together. These things are going to fail if we all try and do it in isolation. But when we start working together in a community such as DevSecCon is putting together here globally, then we have a chance. So we'll pick one of these, whichever you know, takes your fancy, and go. See what you can do. The most important thing we can do right now is feel inspired about the future technology that's coming through and the change it could make. Now, not all of it is sensible and serious. Some of it's just playful. But there is a whole chunk out there that is revolutionizing entire industries, opening up communities to options that they never had before, even educating entire continents. So we all, all of us as engineers, need to find our why for securing things and work together to secure it. So the future of secure development doesn't belong to people like me. Um, it belongs to people like you. It pe belongs to all of us together. If you are building technology that is helping someone or changing the future in some way, then securing it is part of what you're doing now. Now, I have a bit of a challenge for you. It launched just two days ago, and I'm really happy to share it here because maybe we'll get some more uh, people sign up. But um, I am leading a bit of a, a, a community effort we're calling it One Hour AppSec, and the idea is that there's a free AppSec program, launches on the 15th of August, and if you're watching this after that, it's still going, you can still join in. And what we're doing is asking engineers to commit one hour to security per sprint. And to make it really, really easy, we're gonna send you through a newsletter every two weeks that gives you something you can do for an hour, that sprint. Now, just 62, sorry, 62 people signed up in our first 48 hours. That's 1,612 hours of AppSec in one year. So if you imagine every single person signing up, uh, that's a considerable change over time. So if you're looking for a way to get started in AppSec, you could do much worse than just joining in this program. It's free. It's not commercial. I'm not trying to trick you at all. Uh, you can come learn with me and with the rest of the community. And we'll see if we can make a change to all of the technologies, big and small, that are changing tomorrow. Uh, I've been Laura Belmain. You can reach me on the Twitters at, at lady underscore nerd or on LinkedIn or laura at safestack.io. Um, there we go. It's up on the screen. How handy is that? Now, if you have any questions, I am really happy to answer them. And if not, you've been lovely. Um, and I will say goodbye. So any questions? I have a question, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Ah, thank you. Um, you say that that, that one of the things like security should be part of code quality, which I, I, I absolutely um, agree with. But where to start? Yeah, I, I think it, it can be overwhelming when you try and put it in there. Uh, for me, I, I need to unpick my brain's laziness. Um, uh, let me just explain something. Brains love dopamine, right? Um, dopamine lives where there are exciting challenges and novel things. And so we always focus first on the super hard challenges like, oh, I need to do this new form of cryptography or we need to make this a blockchain thing or whatever. Yeah. Um, but in reality, what we need to do is the 80% of the low hanging fruit type of stuff that solves a lot of the, the basic security problems. So this is your common practices. It's like, make sure we don't put any authentication material in our source code repos and make sure that perhaps we keep our dev and test environment separate to each other and perhaps don't use your production data in your test environment. None of which are what I would call sexy problems. And so your brain doesn't like them. It doesn't give you dopamine for doing those. So I would start with the basics, the ugly, boring basics, because they're actually going to help you with like 80% of the problems we see today. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely.
the ugly, boring basics. I will write that down. I'm, Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, if you if you tell it to people, like, if everybody would would agree on that. Like, yeah, yeah, we should do that, but we, we but we don't. So, yeah, it, it it's one of those things, right? You because of your brain wanting dopamine, it's going to look for the novel challenge first. So you gen, it's, it's like choosing to go to the gym. You have just got to go and do it, even if you don't really feel like it. If you would, if 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 we go on on that, like security should be part of part of code quality because I, I think that thrives a lot with 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 engineers and and well, yeah. as we as as uh, as I've looked into your story, like we we do all sorts of cool engineering and we're focusing on on new uh, features and and security is more or less like either a given one or we don't even think of it. Um, yeah. But what do you think should change in for instance um the education system for engineering i mean if mm. i look at my own education i don't have i had a ton of engineering practices and and how to how to build systems what kind of architecture there's in there design patterns whatever security was if there was a thing that was like yeah you should be aware of authentication authorization and that was pretty much it so, yeah, it was the same for me. Security was one guest lecturer when my main lecturer was sick one day and they just they were like, I don't know, they must have just found them in the street somewhere and said, hey, come teach a class. And he talked about the smurfing attack that was done against Amazon. Now, this was the early 2000s when Amazon just sold books. Um, and that was literally it. It was one 30 to 45 minute talk about a really quite obscure type of denial of service attack. Now, for someone like me, there was something about that that resonated that ended up influencing me going forward. But, you know, that's that's a tiny, it's a drop in the ocean of a degree. Um, now, whether you start in a boot camp or whether you go to college and you study traditionally or whether you self-teach, I really do think that the earlier we introduce security, the better. Mm -hmm. But we need to introduce it in an enabling way. So often when we talk about security, if, you know, I'm teaching you, Brian, and we're doing this the old school way, I come to you and I say, hey, I love what you're doing there, but your baby is ugly. You should feel bad. And here's all the things you've done wrong in your life. And that's how we teach security right now. We go, oh, yeah, here's all of your flaws. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, what we need to actually do is go, OK, much like we teach design patterns to speed things up, there are design patterns in security, too. So there are repeatable ways that if we build certain patterns in our, our, our applications that are more secure than others. We also need to teach things like, uh, we teach UX a lot more now than we used to be, um, and usability and accessibility. We don't teach the shadow side of this. So the anti-patterns that you can put into user interfaces and systems design that cause people to make insecure choices. So I think we need to... We, we're very good at teaching our engineers in, in the forms of patterns and enablers rather than barriers and criticism. And we need to reframe security in the same way to say, hey, this is in your bag of tools. Here's how to use it, not you did a thing wrong. I think that is that that is the best way. I mean, you like remembering back in the days when I was starting as an engineer, I always had trouble with the security team because they always come back with a list of defects. It's always like mm. you did this wrong instead of the other way around. Hey, how can we help? And I love that 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 line of uh, line of thinking. Yeah, um, and I think there's an element to the way we handle defects as well that's kind of wrong. So um, I don't know if anyone in the audience has seen James Whitaker talk and talk about QA. And the old days of testing, where if you found a bug, everyone would just whisper about it in a corridor and like, oh, we don't talk about it because like we don't want to be seen to have had bugs. But <laughs> bugs are inevitable. And James Whitaker, being the type of person he is, would stick pictures of his bugs up on the wall and go, hey, look, we found a thing. And it changed it from this shame, quiet, secret thing to a conversation that was happening in the office. Now, I understand the need for some sort of discretion when you're talking about security flaws in production environments, but by keeping them so tight to our chests, by not sharing them, by sharing them the way we do, we don't give people the opportunity to say, hey, oh, so if you found that bug, I know another bit of code that looks just like that. We should probably go look at that too. And those opportunities to expand on a bug and go further are exactly what the vulnerability research community does. So we need to do it in defense as well. Hmm. So, what 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 you're saying? We should we should approach it in the same way as we do with, say, 
maintainability or scalability mm. uh, um, to to make sure that like it's an enabler to make our things better and help each other. That that like that drives Absolutely. in with your hey, uh, if we we don't we don't need to secure one with securing one, we are helping each other. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was there was some so like you, you were talking about uh, uh, things like uh, large language models. Obviously, that's 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 no, I wouldn't say that's not that's not even on height. That that's the thing currently. Yeah, um, I'd say that's um, the thing. But what what uh, what uh, buzz with me is like, yeah, code reviews are no longer a thing if you do large language models. I was like, yeah, and that is for many people one of the only secure security. And mm -hmm. bug hunting measure, measures that they have. Um, yeah. Now I'm confused. What next? Yeah. Uh oh. What now? Yeah. What now, what next? <laughs> that is my like. When you were talking about that, I was like, oh yeah, okay. Um, we already mm -hmm. like pushed for ten years to people say, say people like, are you doing code reviews? Yeah, we're doing mm -hmm. code reviews or pair programming. Like, okay, fair. Uh huh. And then we bought SAST and DAST because that was going to help us speed up the code review yeah. and look for those repeatable. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have an answer, but we need one. And, you know, if if you're like me and you see that problem and part of you like, oh, God, what do we do now? But the other half's like, OK, cool, we'll figure it out because that's what engineers do. So like the, there is not a person on Earth right now who has an answer to that coherently. And so this is a wonderful opportunity for you to sit down and think about if you've got a system where you are using an LLM for something right now, then I want you to sit down and think about how, how on earth can I trace through this? How can I think through this? Uh, how can I create transparency or accountability in a system with less predictability? And it's a really hard problem. So I think you're going to see some really smart people come with solutions. And I think some of those smart people might be in this audience. Hmm. Yeah, I am. I'm like, my brain is now, now, now turning over hours. Is in. I want to know, like, how can we, how can we tackle this? This is a, this is a new thing that we okay. need to need to look into. We cannot stick with the old OS top ten anymore. Just like we still need it, but we cannot stick yeah. with that. There, there's new stuff coming up. Um, I saw this in the chat, and I want, uh, I want, I want to show like uh, the talk looks amazing, and I will, uh, I will, I will watch the recording and write an article uh, or, or or a post on it. Thank you, Nikita. I I, I really appreciate that. And on that note, uh, all talks and including this talk will be on our YouTube channel, uh, like right away, right now. They're now live, but they stay there, uh, and you can look at them um, per chapter on on uh, on our website. Uh, so. Yes, everything is recorded. You can watch everything later. If you go to uh, devsecon.com, you will see the different chapters. And if you are uh, interested in a specific chapter, go there and you can see the talks. Um, yeah, this was this was very interesting, uh, Laura. I I, I I love the way how you uh, how you put the analogies in sports and 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 uh, uh, the winery wine yard uh, in it. And it makes me think, like, yeah, it's not, it's not about just my insurance company's system. Oh, it and our really isn't. Anymore. And that's what we think of in a lot of, lot of. Yeah. In, you see that in a lot of security-focused talks, or like, hey, the bigger systems from banks and insurance companies and the government, like, no, that I think that uh, that what you were pointing on is uh, so spot on. Awesome. So, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Brian. And absolutely, um, I, I enjoyed it. I see that people enjoyed it. So I want to thank you for this 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 virtual session, and I uh, hope to see more of you because um, I just love this talk. So thank you so much. Uh, awesome. The next session for DevSecOn Australia will be at the 17th of August, and the session will be by Sumit Ranjan uh, on AI for DevSecOn engineers. Uh, so. Actually, we're going deeper in in into what we were talking about earlier with with Laura. So please, please feel free to uh, to chime in there. And um, you know, there is somewhere a button below here that you can click to subscribe if you're looking from YouTube or Twitch. I'm not sure where it's here or there somewhere. <laughs> click on subscribe so you will Someone. get notified. Yeah, some or maybe it's up or I don't know. Like it's YouTube. I think it's down. But never mind. Uh, click on subscribe and make sure that you subscribe to this channel that you see not only the session from DevSecCon um, uh, Australia, but 
all the other ones you can you can subscribe uh, subscribe to as well. Uh, and there is uh, there are some amazing gems coming up, and uh, there are already some amazing gems in uh, that you that you can uh, can look up. If you like this video, and uh, um, again, I I love that uh, that like uh, how Nikita was uh, was doing the the, the shout out, and yeah, somebody here as well, like thank you for the amazing live show. Thank you, uh, uh, Abraham. Uh, but if you like it, uh, please feel free to share it with friends or family, preferably both, uh, uh, to see like, okay, let's let's make the make this world a little bit more secure, and uh, uh, maybe even for non technical people, this this is this can be an an, an eye opener. Like, hey, yes, uh, also obvious things like not putting in your password somewhere on a piece of paper that would help. Like, it's it's the little things that can 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 help us out. Um, anyway, Laura, um, I want to thank. I will. I will put your uh, Twitter handle one more time in the uh, on the screen. You can f uh, feel free to uh, uh, to tweet her if you have questions specifically for Laura. Absolutely. Also, feel free to go onto our Discord channel, and you see our Discord channel over here. Uh, please subscribe there, and we can uh, we can talk along. There are a lot of folks from all over the world who talk of DevSec, uh, DevSecOps in all sorts of ways, including this. So feel free to uh, to go there. And um, from that point, I want to want to thank you again. Uh, I am not your normal host. I, I love to do this, but if you feel like maybe I love to be in your spot and and host these kind of sessions and learn th ton of things um, in 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 the meantime, um, feel free to, uh, to 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 do a shout out either on Discord or to connect with uh, with Sam Hebburn, um, and we want to we we will set you up. But for that for now. Again, thank you, Laura, for this great talk. And I will definitely recommend it to a lot of folks. Um, so, yeah, uh, I hope you enjoy your rest of your evening. Thank you so much. All right. Well, that's the end. Um, let me put a, well, we, I think we have a nice banner somewhere to put up. Yes, there we have it.